With go-go dancing, it's really, can you dance and move around and take your clothes off and flirt a little bit? You can do it. (laughs) Hello, I am Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know go-go dancing. So oftentimes when I have American guests, they talk about go-go dancing as though it's this super common thing that you always see in gay bars. And I always feel kind of a little too dumb to ask too many follow-up questions, lest I let on that I have no idea what they're talking about. But this week, I put all of that to one side and asked every single dumb question that I have ever had about the art of go-go. And I was in good hands because this week's guest, Steve V. Rodriguez from the Talk About Gay Sex podcast, used to be a go-go dancer in the 90s. We caught up to talk about the bar In Touch, which was in San Francisco, and the very place where he first shaked his booty. Uh, I don't know why I said booty, sorry. And along the way, we talk about jock straps versus thongs, playing it straight in Hollywood, and having sex with your favorite porn star. Mm. go-go dancing contest, an amateur go-go dancing contest. And I... Oh, this is just like Tales of the City. Yes, very Tales of... Right. <laughs> exactly. Call me Mouse. And <laughs> I just had to do this contest. And as a former gymnast, I was used to competing. And back in high school, I had done talent shows to music and incorporated gymnastics and dance. So when I saw the flyer, because of course there was no social media, the flyer for the best amateur go-go dancer contest at the end touch, my name was written all over it. I knew I had to go. I knew I was going to win. I don't know why I knew I was going to win, but I just knew it. I had that sassy confidence and I think I prepared a number to, do you, you must know this group, M people, back in the day, right? <laughs> wait, wait, was it moving on up? Yes, it was moving on up. Oh, and amazing. that was the song of the time. And if you would imagine, they had a little platform stage about maybe 12 inches off the ground uh-huh. in a corner. So smaller than a posted size stamp of a triangular stage and they had a base on it that was maybe three feet off the ground on the stage with a pole so your job was to do whatever you want in the course of one song mine was of course moving on up by m people because it was the song i was wearing that out that cd it just tells you about the time out (laughs) and i created a routine most of it was just off the cuff, I mean, I don't think I had any major choreography. I knew I wanted to incorporate the pole dance to it, which I did, and I was swinging around and gyrating and took my short shorts off into a a thong, because in those days, I don't think we wore jock straps as much as we wore thongs. And oh, so gross. I had one on and gyra- <laughs> I, gyrating my ass. In <laughs> lo and behold, I did so well, I won the contest, which was a cash prize. I can't remember of what, but I knew part of the prize was a bar tab for the night. And for whatever reason, I was more excited about that because I knew <laughs> that I could buy my friends drinks and didn't make a lot of money back then. So I was super excited to win this contest. So go, go dancing. What am I asking? It's, it's not something you learn about at school. So how did you know what go, go dancing even was when you saw this flyer? 
I think we, at that point, I had gone enough to some bars in and around San Francisco to see go-go dancers. I remember distinctly going to, I think it was 1015 Folsom on Folsom Street, and it was the large Saturday night club at the time. And I remember looking up, and this is when they would put dancers on really high platforms, light them up. And there was one dancer that I just called him Thor because he just had this huge chest and he moved around. Or actually, I think he looked like a Greek god to me. And I was so enamored with him. I would go there every Saturday night to see Thor. And I loved the way he moved. He wasn't the greatest dancer by any means. I think he just kind of moved side to side. But it was that beautiful chest and his sculpted face that got me every time. And I knew I could at the very least do that. But I knew I was a good dancer in general. So I thought with a little bit of gyrating and moving and playing to the audience and winking and nodding, I got this. Again, it's I've later learned how to take good choreography from a good choreographer, but which is much harder to learn that because you have to learn counting and everything associated with that. But oh, no counting. No counting. Yeah, with go-go <laughs> dancing, it's really can you dance and move around and take your clothes off and flirt a little bit? You can do it. <laughs> and, and you said that you wanted to incorporate the pole. Did you have a chance to practice with the pole or was it just like, hmm, I'm going to fling myself at it and hope for the best? Yeah, I didn't. And fortunately, it was a really low ceiling bar. So the, the, the platform was already on a platform of itself. This was three feet taller. So now we're talking four feet. Then the pole went to the ceiling, but in a low ceiling bar. So we're not talking, which I've seen more recently, real pole dancers where they are upside down, releasing their arms, using their legs to... Okay, mm -hmm. no. I would love to learn that just because I think it's amazing and beautiful to watch. And I'm so awestruck whenever I see that. No, mine was swinging and f floating around it and pulling myself away from the bar as I gyrated. And, and slightly rubbing yourself up against it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, sliding up and down. I used it in every way possible that I thought I could without doing gymnastics on the bar like I see today. But it, it was fun. It, it added, you know what it did is it gave you a prop that you could play around with, flirty, wise and added a little bit more dimension than just dancing on a box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's something to hold on to as well. Like, you know, when you're nervous, like having something to grab something. a hold of is kind of comforting, right? Absolutely. And, and do you remember anything about the performance? I just remember moving around the stage a bunch, a small stage, but really connecting with the people that were looking at me. And for whatever reason, conjuring up that performance side in me where you play to the audience, I think is really what I did. And, you know, we do that now in podcasting. I'm constantly talking to a co-host, but I'm also aware of the the audience, the potential audience that's going to receive this. So although it's me and I'm putting myself out there, I'm a little bit more amplified. I'm a little bit more out there. And that's, I think, always been an innate part of who I am is the ability to kind of put a larger self out there. And in dancing, it's easy to do when you have the right gear, too. If you're in a scantily clad outfit, you know, you are... I'm greased up a little. Greased yeah. up and gyrating and the music's pounding and the lights are right and all eyes are on you, then you're going to play to that audience. But that's really interesting that you've compared it to podcasting. Do you feel like this is a performance? I don't feel like it's a performance as much as I am on a platform and a stage. So I probably think a little bit more on painting a picture uh -huh. versus 
when I'm yeah, just talking. Yeah, if we were just kicking, yeah. kicking it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think like you know, I haven't I have an experience of go go dancing, but I have experience of dancing and trying to get people's attention and to put on my peacock feathers. No, what am I talking about? Anyway, showing off, and. Yeah, I don't think they're the same. <laughs> Just like because I, I feel like I'm hyper aware when I'm in those types of performance y, dancing y, luring strangers to their death vibe. I, but with a podcast, I can kind of just, you know start talking shit like I am right now. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. No, no, but I hear what you're saying. There is a performance side in podcasting, but for the most part it's audio and you're not always out there. There's another performance side where you put yourself out there where your whole body I'm a former actor, a gymnast, and I thrive on really immersing myself the few times I did theater in LA, I was nervous as hell the first few times or really before every performance. But once it kicked in and once we got going, I fed off of it. And when mm. they say every performance isn't the same, it really wasn't. And that's what made it exciting. Same mm. with a lot of any kind of time I put myself out there. We've done live podcasts in bars and I love that energy and, and I think I'm looking for something next to kind of take the show on the road or some sort of performance based that mm, gets mm. all of us our whole body into mm. it yeah and I mean having having just said everything that I've said I feel as though it's only in the last few years that I've realized that really everything is a performance yes we're always performing. And I don't think I was ever really aware of that before. And like how you're not trying to impress people, but you're trying to imprint a certain version of yourself on everyone at all times. Or at least you should be because they're judging you. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I was just talking about this on my show yesterday. One of the things I've been doing lately is setting a daily intention. I've gotten into meditating every morning for 10 minutes. And one of the intentions I set every morning is to be in the moment. And the other one is to connect with those I come in contact with. And I cannot tell you since I've been doing that, how effective that has been where I see it. And it doesn't necessarily mean connecting with only those I want to connect with. It's mm -hmm. calmed me down for, say, the person in the grocery store that might be cutting me off or pushing their cart in back of me that I normally would have wanted to snap or get irate over. It's really relaxed me a lot more. And it's had me just connect with those, everybody, you know, in London, in New York, we live in small, confined areas, and you have mm. to learn to deal with people. Well, setting that intention every day has got me to, it might be performance, but it's really me that is connecting with everybody that I truly come in contact with. And it's made daily living so much more enjoyable, I have to say. And so is it just that you're trying to be more present or trying to be more compassionate or some other thing? Present instead of rushing and thinking what is next being mm -hmm. in the moment, enjoying those moments and connecting with those that come in contact and really finding the joy with most, I would say, individuals <laughs> that I come in contact with. Let's not get crazy. <laughs> there's always somebody out there, but making those more finite moments enjoyable. And I think as a whole, it makes your whole day that much more, dare I use the word, effervescent in many ways, and happier. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I could handle effervescence every day. But, you know, there is, yeah. A, a slow bubble of effervescence. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so talk to me about your relationship with acting. I'm going to generalize grossly right now and ask whether you're one of two types of actors. And I recognize that that's completely unfair, but go with me on this. So there are some people who are just kind of born show-offs and like the attention all the time. And then there are some people who 
don't, but still really enjoy acting and still really enjoy kind of channeling their energy through that way. Which are you? The latter for sure. Okay. In fact, okay. I'm very quiet and take a minute to get my conversation going. And back to that intention setting, it's helped me relax a little bit so I don't have such mm-hmm. anxiety when I walk into a group of friends that I don't really know or friends of friends. And I love the the whole process that goes into an acting moment, a performance, a podcast. So I feel if I do all the work, if it's rehearsal, if it's production, getting our podcast ready, whatever that is, if I do the proper work ahead of time, I feel confident and then I can release in knowing that I've done all the work and now I can have fun and perform. But I know I'm not somebody that is constantly seeking attention all the time. In fact, I shy away from it. So, okay, so let's just put a pin in the question that I asked and I want to follow up on the thing that you said about going to see groups of friends or people that you don't know that well. Do you prepare for that? Is that what you're saying? I used to have to prepare for it so much more. And I hate that I keep referring to this meditation that I keep doing. But... Well, you don't live in LA, so it's not that bad. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I did. I did live there, though. Yeah, the former self. And I went and saw one of our co-hosts who moved away because of the pandemic. So he still does our show, but calls mm-hmm. in. And we went to Providence, Rhode Island. And I was meeting his friend as well as a group of people that I had no idea what age group they were. And the old me, former self, would have had a lot more anxiety and had to talk myself into right up into the moment of meeting these friends. I feel now that I'm much more relaxed and I'm just going with the flow that when I met this group this past weekend, I was super comfortable and in the moment and funny. I was funny, Steve. I was storyteller, Steve. I was inquisitive, Steve. All the things that you would want to be. But it's been a a recent shift. I have to Mm. say that for sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about groups of strangers? Yeah. How do you do with them? (laughs) I don't know. I think I'm okay if they are like absolute strangers and I'm never like, I'm not connected to any of them in any way. If they like are friends of a friend, I think I'm more worried about letting that friend down or giving a bad impression that then has an impact on that friend. I've said friend a lot oh, here. Right. I hope you're keeping up. Yes. But, <laughs> but yeah, there is something about that, that, yeah, I don't know. People are confusing to me. <laughs> <laughs> they can be. Yes, absolutely. Mm. But I guess, that, yeah, that is one of the gifts of getting older is that you give less fucks. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's been the other thing too. I'm glad you brought that up. Absolutely. I like I have a sense of humor that doesn't work with everyone. <laughs> and so there was lots of times right. in my like twenties or early thirties, I guess, where I would go and talk to groups of people or, you know, just try and be myself and be like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. I'm really funny. I'm really charming. And then every single joke that I made went like nowhere. And all I got was like blank (laughs) stares. And I think from that, I learned just to like, just be quiet, just don't say anything. And then you're not going to get any of those blank stares. And now I kind of am at a point where I'm like, it's really good news if they don't think you're funny and they stare at you blankly because you'll know not to waste your time trying to win them over. You can. They're not on. your people. They're not yeah, your tribe. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm hilarious. I don't know if you've noticed. I have noticed. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there was a pause. <laughs> no, no. Very charming and very funny. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't have to say that. But it's a great motto. Great motto to follow that... If they aren't finding you funny, well, they're just not your people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like so, so this acting thing, if we go back to that, because that's, that's where we started. Is that the same then? Uh, I'm just applying it directly to go-go dancing. Was it the same thing that you would be maybe shy in a bar until you got that thong on and you jumped on the pole? <laughs> Yeah, I would say in those early 20s, I was much more shy to go out, although San Francisco is very small. 
as cities go. And once I got on the go-go dancing syndicate circuit, if you will, people started recognizing you around. And you're that dancer at InTouch. You're that dancer at this bar or that bar. Because once you got on the circuit, people would book you from various bars and or clubs, even the big Saturday night clubs. And it became kind of a weekly gig, great money maker, and a lot of fun. But with that, people started to recognize me as that dancer that they saw around town. So when I would just go to hang out at a party, or find myself on an off day just at a bar, I would get recognized. And that really helped me come out of my shell, particularly uh, in those early 90s, because we're talking, I'm 22 to 25, formative years as a former shy person, <laughs> this really got me out of my shell in a good way. I think it was really beneficial for me, because otherwise, I think I would have shied and hidden behind a pillar or behind friends. And it was that dancing that I really learned I have that knack for putting myself out there. Uh -huh. And I've used it for acting or maybe not so much acting because you're more insular when you're doing a acting part, but certainly for theater where you really need to project and connect. And definitely all of the radio and podcasting stuff that I do now, which is more me putting myself out there has all stemmed from those early years in San Francisco as a go-go dancer. You used the phrase before, go-go syndicate. And I scribbled it down because I loved those words together. Tell me about the go-go syndicate. H how many go-go dancers were on the scene? And like, what did it look like? What's it, what's it like a day in the life of a go-go dancer? <laughs> well, I can only speak for that era. And in that era, in San Francisco, in the early 90s, we would all take it really seriously, I think, in a good way. We showed up on time. We had a series of three sets minimum that we would do per venue. And some would have you do 20 minutes. Others bumped it up to 30 minutes in the larger dance clubs. Some of the bars were lower, the podium was lower, like the end touch, and you made a lot of tips. So where the bar might pay you ah. $75, so $25 a set, you were guaranteed that, but it was all of the dollar bills and the tips or a heavy big spender that would slip in a 10 or a 20, and you could do really well. The larger clubs, were a scene. It was Saturday night. It was large warehouse clubs. The podiums were huge blocks next to the speakers that you really had to hoist yourself up and climb up there. And you were unreachable, but you looked amazing just because the lights were shining on you. It was pounding music. It was Saturday night. You didn't really make as much tips, but it was really rewarding. And I used to get there early and go to the front bar and grab my margarita by my favorite bartender. And I had a couple favorite bartenders that knew margarita, right, Steve? And of course, I would get that. Make my way into the back dressing room and really fraternize with all the other dancers, and which was always a lot of fun. I wish there was more fun stories of sleeping around in the back, but there wasn't back then. I think we were all so serious. We had our roller bags with so us. Focused filled, on your career. Focused on the career at the moment. Yeah. And, and, and so was there much competition between go-go dancers? You know, we were all really nice to each other i'd have to say but that oh, being boring. said Steve, a little on. boy i know what i will say is the better the dancer you were you got a better spot and better money making dance areas if you were a better dancer or if you were like me that hired the dancers of course i got the better spots and so i think that's really where the competition kind of comes in is like mm -hmm. you really want to make money and you really want to be able to come out of there with a hefty load of cash. And that's where the competition arises. And 
there comes a time in every go-go dancer's life where they decide to stop. What was that like for you? Was it just a moment where you were like, that's it, I'm not doing it anymore? Or did it just, it just tailed off? Well, twofold, I think. First of all, I had ambitions. I was taking acting classes in San Francisco. I fully was aware that I needed to be in Hollywood where all the auditions were going to be had. And I knew my direction was headed towards Southern California. I also knew that once I got there, the management that I was getting set up with would not have me be a go-go dancer. We're talking the early 90s where management even told me, butch it up, being gay in Hollywood is acceptable today. But in the 90s, absolutely not. Certainly not as a Latino man. Mm -hmm. I was not going to be accepted with that. So I already knew that it would end once I moved. And I moved out to L.A. in 1998. But I have to say, despite the trajectory of where I was headed, my battery was wearing out on dancing. It was starting to become a little bit of a chore and exhausting and not as fun as it was, mind you, it was fun for so many years. Mm -hmm. I think it may be a good five years, but at the end of it, it was, it was time. I was not enjoying it. It was becoming a chore to get ready to go out to another bar, another club. And I think I was ready for a new experience. And so like you quit when you moved to LA or? Yes, I quit. Absolutely. Because once I moved to LA, I didn't even go out anymore in LA. I was with a manager that was so strict on wanting me to not be gay that we would go have dinner at six o'clock at these restaurants and I would hang out with him. I would be go to bed. I was like, who am I now? <laughs> totally mm. changed. I was in acting classes and didn't really go out. I went out later on mid early 2000s, I started going back out again. And once I moved out of acting per se, I started, well, I'm in LA, I should really be going out. And this is my early 30s. So I made up for last time. Don't worry. But is this the slutty phase we were talking about? This was the beginning of the slutty phase for sure in LA that I definitely carried over into New York once I finally moved here. So absolutely. (laughs) I did make up for a lot of lost time. But you had dinner with your manager every night, or was that just an example? (sighs) Almost every night. And he was obnoxious. So weird. Yeah. It was yeah. It was not a good situation in the end, and we parted ways because He definitely had, as much as he didn't want me to be gay or show it, he was also gay himself and coming on to me uh, as just a gay man. And it was messed with my mind back then for sure. Did he at least pay for dinner? He did. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, because I had no money. I mean, a poor, (laughs) broke actor who was no longer dancing didn't have those tips. Absolutely, he did. And thank goodness. Yeah. So I got a couple, I got some nice meals out of it. You've got it. You've got to find the silver lining. Yes, um, absolutely. And so I'm aware we haven't really talked that much about N touch. And I want to emphasize that N. Was there anything else that you wanted to say about it? You know, the only other thing that I had a memory of is right before I moved to L.A. and I was winding down my dancing, I remember there was a porn star that was going to be performing there, doing almost kind of like the set that I did when I was trying out. And I knew this go-go dancer because I had one of my first sexual experiences with him. So cut to the early 1991, I believe, there was an adult bookstore in Knob Hill, no longer around, called Knob Hill Cinema. And I remember venturing out, driving over there, parking my dad's truck, and going into this adult bookstore. And it was the (gasps) typical style of theater seating where they showed porn movies. And instead of a porn movie, they would have performers get on stage and go go dance but naked but the one that was up there was this porn star who went by the name of chris stone 
You can look at him up. There's some pictures of him. He was, I believe, Costa Rican. Very sexy man was dancing and he was going around and I was enamored by him. But so were the few people that were there enamored by him. And at the end of his performance, somebody came on the loudspeaker and said, if you want to see more of Chris Stone, make your way to the back of the theater. And we have a room there where you can see him up close and personal. Well, what I didn't realize, because of course I had to see him, was he was standing in this contraption, almost like a bubble. He was dancing there and they had this glove that went inside that you could touch wow. him. but. But not with your hand, not with your grubby hands, right? But with this glove, you could feel him up. And I thought that was the strangest thing, but I had to do it. And he was talking to me through this bubble of plastic <laughs> on the other side <laughs> and flirting with me. And he said, I get off in an hour. Why don't you meet me in the alleyway? Do you have a car? And I said, yes, I do. I met him in the alleyway. He showed up because apparently he said dancers aren't supposed to go home with any patrons. Uh -huh. So I was so excited. I showed up on the dot when he told me to be by the back entrance of the Knob Hill Cinema. He jumped into the car and said, let's go. And he said, let's go to Market Street. And I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to get condoms. Mind you, AIDS epidemic is in full effect, 1990. And we went into Safeway where we went to the back of the store and we got the largest condoms you could buy. He grabbed them and I said, oh, we're not going to go pay for these at the cash register. He said, yes, of course we are. What are you talking about? I said, I was so nervous. He had no Aww. problem, bought the condoms. We got back in my truck. We drove back towards the Knob Hill Cinema where we went to his hotel and he was my first topping experience. In other words, I had never bottomed before. I was nervous as hell, but a porn star like Chris Stone taught me with condoms how to bottom properly. And I want to say it was enjoyable, which it was more of the excitement of it all. But it was also the first time, so it was also painful, too. <laughs> and where does he come into the end touch, you ask? <laughs> <laughs> Years oh. later, before I was moving to L.A., I saw he was going to be performing there. And I was so excited to bring my friends and see him. And in between his show, you could go up to him and tip him. And once you know it, as I said, I met you a few years ago and we had a great... And he nodded, but I knew I was crushed because oh. he, I knew he didn't remember ex who I was. And it crushed me because, but on the other hand, I also, he doesn't know it, but what he did for me was so monumental on a plethora of levels, not to mention safety first and foremost in the 90s using condoms, but he he really had an impact on me and i just was so enamored by that story that Aww. i could see him again a little bummed that he didn't remember me but you can be more than a little bummed i was a little bummed and crushed these days i can look back at it as it's it was a great story at least definitely the original <laughs> meeting him and just how i met him and so if chris stone was here today what would you say to him you don't know what you did for me, but you <laughs> helped me bottom, and I'm a power bottom today. And thank you very much and for keeping me safe <laughs> Wait, <laughs> all hang these on. years later. <laughs> Wait, hang on. Are you saying that you would not have been a power bottom were it not for Christo? He was my first experience of that <laughs> and the first experience to teach. You always remember, never as good as the first time. Oh, there are plenty of times better than the first time. There are. Yeah, there are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quoting my favorite singer, Sade, and <laughs> one of her songs. But there are, definitely, I perfected it and continue to revise it every time now. So, yeah. <laughs> always room for improvement. Well, yeah. If you're out there, Chris, thank you. You... you set Steve on a long path of things in his backside. No, sorry, I didn't know how to finish that sentence. But thank you, Chris. In my um, sexual journey, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and so then if we go super cheesy and 
think back to In Touch. What did that venue teach you about yourself? Wow, so many things I think it taught me. It, it was really the performance side of me that came out. It was the first go-go dancing that set the tone that really got me out of my shell is really probably priceless, right? It's why I'm able to do a lot of the things that I do today, not really caring and caring for sure, but not mm -hmm, caring mm -hmm. what people think. Not over caring. Not over caring. It taught me responsibility to show up on time and to even though it's go-go dancing, to take it seriously. And you have a job to do to you are part of the entertainment for however many patrons show up tonight. And I principles that I take with me today for all the work that I do now, it taught me, it just, I, if I can't state it enough, it really took me out of my shell that I had been living under and really gave me a voice in many ways. And so if you could go back in time and have a conversation with the Steve that was just about to perform at the Go-Go Dancer competition, what, if any, advice would you give him? To enjoy the moment that you are about to experience, to connect with your audience by all means, because that is really what is going to keep you fueled up and want to continue to give your best performance and give all of you in this one performance and enjoy it. And, oh, the other important question, did you sing along with Moving On Up or does that kill the I, vibe? You really can't sing along, but I think when my back was <laughs> to the audience... <laughs> I was mouthing a couple because it's such an infectious song. I can hear it right now in my head. In fact, I'm probably going to have to play it after the show. I'll do the sax solo. You do the sax? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those songs that, yeah. But in general, no, I don't think. We're not drag queens, and so we're not doing a lip sync for your life. <laughs> we're yeah. more of the pit crew. <laughs> yeah, that's annoying, isn't it? Like, to keep your sex appeal, you have to kind of be mute. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> it's very annoying. <laughs> uh, do you have any memories of In Touch or clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, please get in touch. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing. Go to lostspacespodcast.com and find the section Share a Lost Space and tell me all about what it is you got up to. You can also reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where my handle is Lost Spaces Pod. Find out more about Steve's podcast, Talk About Gay Sex, by listening to the show wherever you find podcasts, maybe even the app that you're using right now to listen to this, maybe, just maybe, or follow them on Facebook and Instagram where their profile is Tags Podcast, T-A-G-S. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. <laughs> <laughs>